Welcome to Mars Stream in Solo Arts Heal. Hello, Gail. Welcome. How are you? Hello, Stephanie. I'm great. Thank you so much. And welcome um, to Solo Arts Heal, um, the Mars Stream platform where our, our solo artist storytellers share inspiring, amazing true life stories as survivors and caregivers in dramatic and hilarious stories of overcoming adversity, surviving mental and physical challenges, and becoming their own health and life advocates. Um, tonight, we're pleased to present Jude Trader Wolf performing excerpts from her award winning solo show, This Isn't Helping, a particularly great title considering Jude is a therapist, a creative arts therapist st turned storyteller whose comedic account of a longtime therapist's struggle with burnout after 20 years of treating trauma and um, her search for renewed hope and the spark to continue doing the work she loves. Following Jude's live performance, we're going to be joined in Talkback with um, Jude and with Jean Campbell, co-founder of Brave Hearts Retreats, which offers experiential retreats and workshops for personal growth and healing, as well as professional training for therapists and healthcare providers. Tonight is each week, Solo Arts Heal is our gift to the communities we share. Each week, our shows are designed to offer information and inspiration for individuals and community empowerment and advocacy. Here each week, outstanding storytellers shed light on their diverse mental and physical health related stories, stories shared across all communities about cancer, caregiving, and many other illnesses and disorders, which are highlighted in remarkable performances and discussed in conversation with the artists and guest experts and in talkbacks with you, our audience. Added to this now once a month, we're addressing the health crisis of climate change, shedding light on the many problems caused by the climate crisis and how we can work together to solve them and be good caretakers of Mother Earth. All of these shows highlight and embrace the healing power of the arts with humor, with drama, with grace, as we have tonight with our featured performer, Jude Trader Wolf. Let me tell you about her. Jude Trader Wolf is a creative arts therapist turned storyteller, writer, performer, singer, songwriter, and improviser who is active in the New York uh, storytelling scene and all around the country and books shows, workshops, and keynotes um, nationwide. She is the host, uh, creator of True Things, a game wrapped in storytelling show that features true stories, and you'll be able to see the link in the chat. Um, stories with a twist that grew into monthly cultural event at venues on Long Island and New York City and travels to communities all around the country, including a teen edition. Now, I'd love to know more about that as well. Jude is remarkably active in a national story uh, storytelling scene. And her solo show, This Isn't Helping, was selected for the 2018 Speak Up, Rise Up Storytelling Festival and performed at the Off-Broadway Connolly Theater, among many other theaters and festivals, uh, including the Examine Life Conference at the, um, or excuse me, um, other festivals. And then she had another solo show called Crazy Town, also played many theaters and festivals, including the Examine Life Conference at the Carver College of Medicine in Iowa City, as well as a successful run at Actors Theater Workshop in New York City. She is a certified practitioner of applied improvisation. She served as chair of the 2019 Applied Improvisation Network World Conference in partnership with the Alan Alda Center for Communicating Science, which took place at Stony Brook University um, last August a licensed clinical social worker, certified group psychotherapist, and creative arts therapist. She presents at conferences and organizations around the country about applications of storytelling and improvisation in clinical and educational settings. New York Daily News recommends self-medicate with real-life therapist Jude Trader Wolf. Expect the unexpected and without the hourly rates. Please, Join me now in welcoming to her own solo stage, performing live excerpts from her hit show, This Isn't Helping, Jude Trader Wolf. So I'm seeing this guy, Jake, and he's thoughtful and reflective and seems to be searching for his place in the world. And, and one day out of the blue, he says, I can't do this anymore. And that hurts because I'm his therapist. And I did not see this coming. I'm blindsided. And I don't know if it's because I'm feeling off balance lately. It's November of 2003. 
just two years after the attacks on the World Trade Center, which rocked New York, shook the nation, and sent torrents of traumatized patients into therapist's office, including my own. And it's been a lot. I've been treating trauma for 20 years, and these two years have been very intense. So I'm thinking maybe that's why I'm off. But immediately, this committee inside my head starts deliberating. The analyst in my head says, oh, well, it's been six months. So maybe he just wants to bail because things are getting a little deeper. And then the critic in my head says, no, he wants to bail because you're doing a terrible job. And then the rational voice in my head says, uh, well, he just lost his job. Maybe he can't afford to do this anymore. And then the missionary in my head says, well, then you have to lower his fee. That's the right thing to do. And then another voice that sounds suspiciously like my mother says, you get paid to do this? Really? And then the teenager in my head says, yeah, mom, it's a real job that takes energy and focus and an office. And then the analyst in my head says, ooh, Maybe I remind him of his overbearing mother. And then I realize he's waiting for me to respond to him. So I, I look at him and I say, okay, if this isn't helping, it's fine. Let, I want you to think for yourself. So let's just tell me what's going on. And he says, I've joined the army. I want to go to Iraq. And I lean in and I say, tell me everything. Tell me how you came to this. But inside, my stomach is in knots, my heart is pounding, and I'm filled with a surge of energy because I am actively protesting this war. I'm horrified by this war. I think this war is a tragedy building on another tragedy we haven't even dealt with yet. And I have to hold all that in. That is not his problem. That is not anything that I should pass along to him. And I'm focusing on him and he doesn't know as far as I can tell that how much I'm struggling, but that struggle to keep my passionate emotions and feelings and thoughts to myself and focus on what my client needs is taking more energy than it should and more than it used to. So a month later, I'm lying on my back, looking up into the piercing blue eyes of Sharon, my new acupuncturist. And she says, so tell me what's going on. And I say, my back's in a spasm. I have pounding headaches nearly every day now. My digestion issues, but it's not a medical problem. So they told me I have to come see you. And she says, while she's putting needles in various spots, well, what's going on emotionally? And I say, oh, it's... It's like this gray shadow over everything. I, it's like a feeling like all is lost. I guess it's depression. And then she puts a needle somewhere in my left arm that sends a bolt of electric pain through my whole body. I almost jump off the table. And she goes, ah, that's the wounded healer point. What do you do for work? And I say, yeah, I'm a therapist who wants to see a therapist that feels like all is lost. But I haven't always been like this. I'm working on it. And she says, well, with all these symptoms that you have, you know, it looks like you have a pretty good case of burnout. And I'm, I'm thinking, yeah, I know. Like right now I should be relaxing. And instead, as soon as I try, start to relax, I get activated. And I start thinking about one of my clients who was the last person to talk to her brother on the 101st floor of the World Trade Center before, you know, he died. And another woman who was late for work that day and everybody on her team died and she saw terrible things and other people who saw terrible things that day. And they bring those memories and those stories to their therapy work. And I'm, I show up for that. I'm supposed to do that. And I want to do that. But now those stories and those memories are backing up on me and waking me up at night and giving me intrusive thoughts. And the worst part of it is, I say to Sharon, the worst part is I feel ashamed about having all these symptoms because it didn't happen to me. I didn't lose anybody. And she says, well, you lost something and you gotta figure out what that is. And when the needles go in, they sting at first and there's a lot of heat and then they vibrate and then there's a radiating warmth that goes out through my body. And as the needles kind of do their thing, I kind of go into a zone. And Sharon says, you know, one of my teachers told me when I said I was having trouble working with so many people in chronic pain and, and, and patients who were dying and really suffering. And he said, you have to ground yourself in a memory or an image of something real for you that fills you with a sense of awe and wonder so that you can handle all this human suffering. And for me, I know exactly what that is immediately. I'm nine years old. My 19 year old brother wakes up my sister and me and says, 
you have to come outside. Something amazing is happening. And for hours, we lay on the hood of our parents' blue Pontiac station wagon, staring up at an astonishing display of shooting stars. And my brother, who's an aspiring physicist, says that according to Einstein, some of the stars we're looking at don't even exist anymore. They burned out a thousand years ago, maybe, in some faraway galaxy. But that light travels. It never stops traveling. And so we see that light as if those stars exist right now. And that light will continue to travel. And so people in the future on some other planet will see that same light as if it's happening in that moment. It's past, present, and future in this great resounding now. And I don't understand it, but I believe it. And it's transcendent. And it fills me with a sense of awe and wonder. But I've lost that. And I cannot seem to get it back. And I'm looking for help anywhere I can get it. Now, I start getting emails from an organization called Voices of September 11th. And this is an organization created by two social workers who both lost their sons in the World Trade Center and immediately jumped into action, created this not-for-profit that offers support groups and trauma recovery and resiliency training, and it's wonderful. And every year on the anniversary of September 11th, they do a full day event. And because I'm a first responder, they invite me to come at no charge. And even seeing that email, as the years go by, the next few years, every time I see that email, I get this clutch in my stomach and I just can't go. But I am in a support group in New York City at an institute, a, a therapist, I'll say her name is Joanne. And Joanne reminds me of Dr. Melfi in The Sopranos. She could be looking at a car crash or a baby sleeping, have the exact same look on her face. I don't know if she's clueless or she's calm. I cannot read her. But I know that she loves, she lets us talk and we do share, but she loves the internal reflection. She does a lot of meditation exercises and we start the group that way. And I have at this point a terrible time with this. So she'll say, go in, breathe, check in with yourself. And as soon as I start to let go a little bit, we're on immediately. Those, in, those thoughts start coming and those images start coming. And then the analyst in my head says, this isn't helping. This is making things worse abort. And then the critic in my head says, well, if it's not working, it's because you're not doing it right. And then the rational voice in my head says, she knows what she's talking about. She's very respected. So get on board. You've got paying clients that are counting on you. And then another voice that sounds suspiciously like my mother says, you get paid to do that? Really? And I want to stop, but I stick it out for week after week because she does this thing with her voice at a certain point where she goes, deeper and deeper, deeper and deeper. And I want to laugh, but I also kind of can't get out of the hypnotic trance of it. Deeper and deeper. And, I, and then she says, go in and ask your inner self, what do you want? And when I make it that far and I follow her voice and I go in and I say to my inner self, what do you want the same answer every time? Dunkin' Donuts, pizza with everything on it. Because another thing I've learned about burnout is that you crave fat and sweets. So after eight weeks in Joanne's group, if there had been an evaluation that had said, what did you gain from this tra uh, trauma therapy support group? I would have said about 30 pounds. So I'm trying non-conventional therapies and workshops. I go to a retreat in Southampton on Long Island uh, where there was a very interesting woman. Um, she called herself Luna. She referred to herself as an oracle. She, she was about five foot two, very compact, um, uh, blonde ringlets emanating from her face like the rays of the sun. And her persona was like if Oprah Winfrey and Shirley MacLaine had a baby that was born fully grown, quoting Joseph Campbell's Hero with a Thousand Faces. You are on the hero's journey. Your struggle becomes your strength. You must get pen to paper. You must write out your pain 
every molecule of emotion out on the page, every memory, every troubling thought until you are exhausted of all of your pain and your burdens. And you take those papers and you tie them to a rock and you go to the ocean and you heave that rock into the ocean and know that your pain and burdens are to the universe what that rock is to the ocean and you will see it disappear and you will be released and you can start clean. And the missionary in my head says, is it really that easy? And the analyst in my head says, I am a licensed clinical social worker. She calls herself an oracle. And the rational voice in my head says, that sounds crazy. And all the rest of me says, I am definitely doing that. And I do that. Eh, not that helpful. Now I start going to talk to anybody that will explore this topic with me. So this life coach says, if you want to recover from burnout, you have to know yourself. There's another retreat that said, you have to love yourself. I went to a Zen uh, therapist that said, you have to lose yourself. And then there was a person that said, probably like, I don't want to listen to you anymore. I, I've had it that said, you got to get over yourself. So I'm supposed to love my, know myself, love myself, lose myself, and get over myself. It's like I'm dating myself, but with a copay. Well, in 2015, I finally say yes to the Voices of September 11th invitation to go to the event on the day that they're opening up the memorial for the first time. The, the building's been open, the World Trade Center's been operational, but the memorial is open. And I think this is the time. And as I get off the subway, and I'm walking up the stairs, my legs feel like they're sandbags and my heart is pounding and I start to sweat. And I think, see, I thought I was doing so much better. All those people helped me, everybody helped me a little bit. I'm, and here I am back where I started, but I push on, I'm here, I'm going, and I get to the event in the Marriott Hotel and I open the door. And it's a spacious banquet room, huge, with round tables all around, linen tablecloths, linen napkins, candles in the middle of each table. So it's low lit and very serene. And on each table, there's a plaque that identifies who will be sitting there, like a wedding almost. And on this table, there's a plaque that says Sandy Hook Trauma Team. And this table, it says Boston Marathon Trauma Team. And this table, it says San Bernardino Trauma Team. And I find my table, which is independent practitioners like myself, and I sit down and there's all these strangers in the room laughing and talking to each other as a low hum. And I feel a connection to these people that go into the darkness. And here they are. And I feel some pressure leave me. And the talks and workshops are wonderful all throughout the day. And the last talk of the day is an FBI agent who says she was responsible for the final disposition of the remaining parts of the plane that flew into the Pentagon. Now, these parts were evidence in a crime and the FBI had been investigating the crime and they were done. They'd been through explosions and chemicals and she was just going through them to see what needed to be kept or left. And she sees sticking out of the bottom of one of the seats, a bulge, the back of the seat. She reaches her hand down into the, 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 the back of that seat and she pulls out a pocketbook. And inside the pocketbook is a wallet. And in the wallet is ID and letters that have been folded into tiny squares and stuffed into that wallet and stuffed into that pocketbook, which was buried in stuff in the back of that seat. And an ID. So they put these letters to be readable. And she said, I brought them to the husband myself written by a woman who knew what was happening and she wanted her family to know she was loving them and thinking of them in her final moments. And the FBI agent said, I brought them to the husband and I said, I'm so sorry it took us so long to get these to you. And he said, no, this is exactly the right time. 
my son's going through a really rough period and this is like she's still with us. And to me, those letters are what hope looks like because she knew that all was lost and she did it anyway. And that fills me with awe. And those letters found their way to her family against all odds. And that fills me with wonder. And I think this husband, all those years of grieving his wife and their life together and not knowing there was another chapter in their story that was still unfolding and that would impact all these other people, just never know. And I think about Jake who did do a tour in Iraq and he made it back and his family that supported him. And I think about those shooting stars and the light that goes on forever. Thank you. Ah, there, Jude. Thank you, thank you so much. What a beautiful, beautiful story. Thank you, thank you. Yes. Um, that's incredible. And the work you do is incredible. I, I can't really quite imagine, you know, what you go through as a therapist um, and how much you take in. And um, it's beautiful that you have put this and expressed this in, in a wonderful show that has humor and, and, and your, your fabulous storytelling. <laughs> was, was it through here when you started doing your true things um how did you start uh doing your you created true things how did that start okay so do, just to clarify so the show is called mostly true things just to oh. be clear when people go to it it'll say it says mostly in parentheses i saw true things oh, and good. that's the reason for that is and i'll tell you about the origins of it uh very quickly but uh the reason that it's called this is that there's a game in the show so you People tell true stories. It's a curated show. It's not a slam. You know, there are people that submit stories. I work with them or, or they're ready to go. And three of them include subtle little lies. Two, like two or three subtle little lies. It could be, you know, I took the A train and I got off at Walnut Street and a tra the A train doesn't stop at Walnut Street. Just very subtle things that people have to really listen for. And one person tells their story with no lies. So they're true stories, but three of them are mostly true. And uh, then the audience gets to question the storytellers and they try to break them down and figure out what the lies are. And then they vote for the person they think told it straight with no lies. And if they vote correctly, they get a tote bag that says my superpower is discernment. I wanted there to be a show on Long Island. That's really the reason I created that show. Um, I wanted, there was no show on Long Island at the time. And I would have to go to the city to perform all the time or travel around. And I thought, why not try to create a storytelling scene on Long Island? And people, it took a while, it's, you know, for people to get into it. Um, and uh, now it's, well, now we're not doing anything. Well, you know, nobody's doing anything, but. <laughs> well, actually you sound like you've been quite busy. Well, I have, uh, yeah, oddly enough in the pandemic, um, submitted myself to different shows or, or things came along and I said yes to everything. And it's been really a ton of fun to be in shows in uh, my studio, in my space. <laughs> and, uh, and, and I'm enjoying that a lot. And I'm also enjoying that people from around the country and around the world can see us do what we're doing here and what you guys are doing. And, uh, and that, that normally mostly true things is a Long Island audience or a New York City audience or wherever we may happen to be. So yeah, you're, you're so active in the national storytelling scene. I've just seen uh, from PBS stories in the stage in Boston, Story District in Washington, DC. Uh, there's, there's a lot of different uh, experiences. One uh, was now you're talking the Armando Diaz experience at the Magnet Theater. Yeah. Singing. There's a lot of storytelling shows and I try to hit the circuit. I guess I'm just, I just got to get out there. I need it. <laughs> I really do. 
And before this show, you had um, a Crazy Town. Was that your first? Um, solo? Yeah, I I wrote a story, I, a solo show, from a story that it, uh, that I had done in a in a class, and and I my teacher Kevin Allison from Risk. I was working with him on the story and then it, it expanded out into a full length show. And then I decided to write some songs to go in it with my writing partner, Wells Hanley. And then we took it to San Francisco. We actually did it in the San Francisco fringe. We did it in the Chicago fringe, the Manhattan. Uh, we did it a bunch. We did it a lot. And uh, that show, we, I traveled even more than this one. This show is newer and I haven't traveled as much as I did with that one. But that one was about a very upsetting event that happened in my first year of working in psychiatry as a music therapist and it was a very important learning experience very difficult learning experience yes i saw um, a video of that i think it's on your website and um, where you had uh, some sexual harassment oh yes that that happened that's not in crazy town that was one of the crazy that was a, a, a sideline <laughs> that i was being sexually harassed by my boss Oh, That's God. not actually in that show at all, but it was at that job. It was at that job. It okay. was it was a it was a very difficult environment. But you know what the thing is about going through things like being sexually harassed by your boss and feeling like you're going to get fired if you don't do what he wants, or making a terrible mistake that nearly cost someone's life, as what happened with me. Those things change you, and then there there are stories that I think are they're useful to to the world. I find those stories useful when other people tell them, and I love crafting a real experience into something that I think has art, hopefully, and has meaning for people and is helpful to people. Mm -hmm. Yes, you're a certified practitioner of applied improvisation. Yeah. Uh, so I think that in itself sounds like a wonderful title. <laughs> <laughs> Well, I, you know, I love improv and I um, use improv to help people therapeutically and also to help people develop communication skills and collaboration skills and to think on their feet and, and to have a ton of fun while doing it. Um, so I am actually, you know, it's, it's not in this 20 minute excerpt from This Isn't Helping, but my improv training started in this burnout recovery process. That was one of the key things that started me on an upward spiral besides this event at the, that, that was like a turning point, this thing that happened at the World Trade Center that day. Um, but for years I had been training in improv and that was keeping my energy up even when I um, didn't feel good or I was struggling. I learned from improv how to change my brain how to be in the moment, how to support other people and, and have a wonderful time and really be creative. So improv was a huge part of my own recovery. And now it's my life that, you know, it really is. That's great. Yeah. That must've been so hard going to that, um, into that uh, experience with all the first responders to the hotel for the banquet for the 9-11. It was a hard day until I got in the room. And when I saw those trauma teams sitting at those tables, everything started to shift. It was just the reality of what, how much there is of pain in the world. And here are these people and they're, you know, helping each other and surviving. And it was, it was really good to be with them. And that was, it was a, a huge healing to be, just to be with them. Mm -hmm. And that's, it was hard until I got in the room. And as soon as I got in the room, I was the beginning of a, of a shift and it stayed with me until now. <laughs> mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Well, you do a beautiful job of showing all the voices in your head as a therapist and your rational self and your, and your mother, <laughs> and all the different voices that go on. You can't on. have a therapy show without mentioning your mother. You yeah, know, right. Exactly. <laughs> Um, I want to bring into our conversation um, Jean, and and um, but before that, I do want to uh, remind um, our our audience that please um, it posted in the chat as always is the tip jar. So any support you're able to give is greatly appreciated. And um, and also as always, we encourage questions and comments from the audience. So um, you can post those in the chat. We'll address as many as we can, and our producers Brian and Brianna will help us keep an eye on that. 
And um, so now let me welcome to the conversation our guest um, and introduce Jean Campbell. Jean is co-founder of Brave Hearts Retreats, which offers experiential life-changing retreats and workshops for personal growth and healing, as well as professional training for therapists and healthcare providers. She's been bringing groups of people together to heal for more than two decades. She's a licensed clinical social worker, a board certified trainer and practitioner of psychodrama and sociometry, a certified professional coach, a somatic experiencing practitioner, a practitioner and trainer of psychodramatic body work, and earned a certificate in positive psychology. So lots of great things to talk about. She specializes in trauma um, reorganization, somatic psychotherapy, and addiction codependency recovery by providing psychodrama training groups for professionals. So we're going to hear more about that. Um, it's also personal growth workshops and intensive for individuals. So um, let's have her tell more about it. Um, because she's committed to creating safe spaces for healing and growth and trust that what we can't do alone, we can do together. So Jean, thank you so much for being here. Thank you, Gail and Jude. Thanks for inviting me. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. And you know, I've, I've seen the show and I've heard excerpts of it multiple times. And as somebody who was in New York City on 9-11, I was choked up again listening to the story. Um, and I, the thing I heard the most that I think is so important, which is the last thing that you just said, Gail, is the only way through these kinds of experiences is to have a team of people, a group of people that we can feel safe enough with and share honestly about the truth about what's going on. And for those of us who are helping professionals, um, it gets harder and harder to find those safe places because we can't bring those kinds of feelings to our clients. It's inappropriate. Um, so to be able to have a community like the one that you had downtown when you went that day, Jude, I, I really get that. Um, I was reminded there's a, um, a term we use in psychodrama, and Jude has a very strong background in that as well. That's how we met, actually, a very long, very, very long time ago. Long time ago. Um, at least 25 years ago, probably more at this point. Um, but there's a, a term we use, it's called being doubled. And a double is basically somebody who gets you so well on the inside, they could actually speak for you. And I just had this vision of you walking into that room of first responders, Jude, and just that yeah. that can happen because it's like, I'm in a room of doubles. I don't even have to say anything and people get me. Exactly. Uh, such yeah. relief in that. And regardless of whether you're a helping professional or you work in business or you work, it doesn't matter. We all need our people. And I think that's part of what's, what's making it so difficult right now during COVID is that we, you know, our first line of defense when something like this happens is to move towards each other. And after 9-11, we literally did. We held each other and we cried with each other. And we can't do that during COVID, uh, which, which makes it even more difficult. So, um, so Braveheart Retreats basically... <laughs> You want, you want to make the universe laugh, launch a retreat center in early 2020, and then the world turns upside down, to quote Lynn manuel Miranda. Um, and uh, so we've, we've been doing a lot of work virtually to help people, particularly helping professionals, walk through this really interesting and challenging time. Um, because as Jude knows, you know, going through something like 9-11 or now going through COVID, we're carrying our own stuff about this as helping professionals and we still have to hold space for other people. So we have multiple layers of this. Um, so yeah, I mean, it, in some ways it feels quite similar to 9-11 and in some ways it feels completely different. And I'm yeah. sure Jude can vouch for that as well. Yeah. Do you want me to speak to that for a second? Um, sure. please. Uh, so yeah, um, and because, well, the, the traumatic, the, the reality of trauma isn't unique to therapists. The thing that's unique about being a therapist and then going through something at the same time that your, your clients are going through it is that's, generally that doesn't happen, that there's a world event that, that you're coping with at the same time that, that your clients are coping with it. Um, and 9-11, I did have that shame and guilt that I didn't actually lose a family member um, we did know, uh, we had a couple of clients, my husband and I, that, that died in the tower. So we did know people really well that, mm -hmm. that had died. Um, but I felt actually shame and guilt about having all these symptoms. Uh, and I worked that all out. But this thing that we're in right now, this, this is something else. <laughs> I mean, this is, 
But what I know is that having we're been trained trauma- for this one, but we're trained for this and Trump, people who are really traumatized in a lot of ways know feel like this all the time, the way the whole world feels. Exactly. <laughs> They're like, a oh, lot of, a yeah, lot the of whole my world clients. is doubling for you now. <laughs> right, exactly. So a lot of my clients, when 9-11 happened, particularly people who had really severe developmental trauma, sexual abuse, physical abuse, emotional abuse, et cetera, when 9-11 happened and it was literally destruction all around us, they said, it feels like my outsides are finally matching my insides. Yeah. And I've heard that from a lot of people during COVID as well, particularly yeah. because I have such a strong background in working with addiction, which Jude does as well. Um, that sense, of, I mean, I, I put up I put up a post as kind of a joke uh, weeks ago, but I got so many responses to it on Facebook because I'm a recovering alcoholic. And, and I was like, who knew that my scale of isolation was so transferable, right? It's like, I can do this. <laughs> and yet, <laughs> Well, you know, one of the things that I think is incredibly challenging for people right now is that they don't know how to sit still with themselves. You know, we're in a world where there's always some, you know, there's a tablet to pick up or a phone or there's an internet site or there's a TV show or there's, and people are really having a hard time just looking at those four walls and, you know, depending upon where you're living and the level of lockdown, um, and it's no surprise that, you know, as Jude said, what did you get out of this? Oh, I got 30 pounds out of it. You know, but for some people, like I read a statistic a couple of months ago, I got consulted to make some comments about an article somebody was writing about addiction flourishing during this time. And I read a statistic that in mid-April, 40% of New York City people who were uh, polled admitted to day drinking. 40%. Really. And those are the people who admitted it. Yeah. Right? Wow. So I, I err on the side of compassion for people around that, myself included. It's like, I am going to go to those defenses or those default behaviors that are going to bring me comfort at a time where it's really hard to find comfort because I can't be connected to my community in the way that I'm normally connected to my community. So I think the, the shame that you're talking about, Jude, um, I mean, I think a lot of therapists, and I do, I do quite a bit of coaching and supervision and ther- groups for therapists, and a lot of them have been talking about the shame of why am I having such a hard time with this? Why am I struggling so much? You know, and part of breaking down the reality of burnout is to go into the reality. It's like, well, let's see why you're struggling with that. You have two small children at home that you're trying to homeschool. You're trying to have a practice virtually, which you've never done before, you and your partner or husband or whoever you're living with are around each other 24 hours a day, which you don't normally have happen. Just one of those would be dysregulating. And you've got three or four of them all at the same. Oh, and you're holding space for all these clients Mm -hmm. who are freaking out. Mm -hmm. Um, You know, let's not forget people are unemployed and people are struggling. I mean, in California, I know multiple people who've been trying to get through to the unemployment office for two months, you know, so we're all stressed right now, all of us. And the truth is your therapist is stressed too. (laughs) (laughs) You don't need to know that, but they are. Well, yes, yes. Well, this is something, you know, this is a good uh, format to talk about that because, you know, um, Jude had brought up, can anyone get burnout or is it only people in in the helping professions? I mean, anybody can get it. Absolutely. Um, And I think part of the, part of the sneaky thing about burnout is that we live in a culture that applauds workaholism, Mm -hmm. right? And so when people start to feel like they're not, you know, that voice that sounds uncannily like your mother in your head. I don't remember what your exact words were. But when those voices come up, like, what's wrong with me? What's wrong with me? People will tend to double down and work harder. And, um, and then it's like a vicious cycle because then they're exhausting themselves more. Jude talked about in that piece so eloquently, there's so many physical symptoms that people have. Um, and what a brilliant acupuncturist to say, oh, well, yes, you're having GI distress and you're having headaches. And, you know, some of the other symptoms people will have is low back pain or trouble sleeping. Um, they might have heart issues. They, frankly, they might have sexual dysfunction issues. Uh, there's all kinds of things that will happen somatically. 
And a lot of times people don't make that connection between the body and the emotions. No. And so well, that's, they'll well, just try harder. Go ahead, Jude. Well, I was going to say the other thing that it, not only do we celebrate in a, in a big way, like working harder and working a lot and not sleeping much and sort of like celebrate that. Um, but we also aren't, you know, even though we were Oprah-fied, we're not really connected to our emotions, I think, in this culture. And so to make that connection is very challenging. And especially when you're going through burnout, it's more, you feel more and more sort of detached right. and it's very confusing. But the thing about, I think that, so, um, so Gail, when you said, can anybody burn out? And the reality is, especially people in caregiving roles, but that includes parents, people who have elderly parents that they're, that they're taking care of, teachers. There are people in certain professions that have a higher risk of burnout, but anybody that overdoes and doesn't take care of themselves, you know, is, is going to find that role getting fatigued and strained and it will turn into, it will turn on you. Like what's good about it will actually turn into a bad thing, like a toxic thing. Right. Right. And, and the thing is, is that even if you're not in a helping profession, a lot of parents come home after a full day of work and they're helping, right, to raise their children. Hopefully it's a collaborative helping. And so it's like they're working till two full-time jobs. Mm -hmm. And right now it's not as if daycare is a possibility. The kids aren't in school. So even if people are working in sort of corporate America, they've got that extra layer on top of it. And people are having to pitch in to do all kinds of things that they normally would hire people to do. Um, yeah, that's right. 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 So like I haven't cleaned my own house in years and it's a huge luxury. And I know that, and I'm not, I mean, I, I'm grateful. I have a roof over my head. My rent is paid. I know that a lot of people right now are struggling to find money to pay their rent. I get that. And, and yet there's, there's things like having babysitters and getting your house cleaned and having gardeners and, you know, even like taking your car to the car wash or whatever it is, a lot of those kind of day-to-day -day things that are, are not things that we have to do if we're lucky enough to have the, the kind of income that we can afford to do those kinds of things, um, we have to do all of that ourselves now. So, um, so and I think our culture is finally coming to terms with, oh, maybe we should pay those essential workers more because <laughs> those people are essential in the country, actually. <laughs> anyway. Yeah. I digress. <laughs> not at all. Not at all. We're, we're, we're all in the we're all in this boat. And um and and when we look at what are some of the signs and symptoms? You've mentioned some things, but of 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 burnout that people might not be aware of. And and then, well, let's start with that. Well, I think Jude talked about some of those in her uh, piece. Um, as you said, Jude, a lot of times people don't recognize the emotional piece. Um, so having, you know, being more irritated than usual, that's a sign, uh, crying more easily than you usually do, um, disconnecting more too. Like I'm hearing from a lot of people who normally might watch an hour of TV a night that they're sitting and binging on a TV show for eight hours straight, but that's not normal for them. And it's a way, you know, albeit a healthier way, but it's a way that people are checking out these days. Um, those are some of the kind of immediate signs I think of. And then as we already talked about, there are definitely somatic signs. And nowadays <laughs> when people get a little sniffle, they think, oh my God, do I have COVID, right? Um, but the somatically also things like noticing more muscle aches and pains in the body, more tension, more sort of holding in the system, um, gastrointestinal issues, um, lack of appetite, eating more than they usually do, um, certainly drinking more than they usually do, uh, sleep disturbances, a lot of those kinds of physical things that people would normally chalk up to something else mm -hmm. to be able to, even if it's just, you know, we talk in somatic experiencing about building our capacity. So even if all I have is the capacity to sit still for three minutes and just kind of do a body scan and check in and see what's going on, Am I noticing that there are things that are disturbing my system um, that normally I would just kind of make up excuses, some other reason for that. Also starting to isolate 
from people or stopping the usual connection, like instead of picking up the phone and talking to somebody or getting on a Zoom call, texting. Um, and you I know, just I, wanna, go ahead, Jim. Also, resentment. I, I want another sensation or resentment. Yeah. Yeah. Like feeling like the, the, this thing that used to give meaning. And I'm not saying that a therapist might feel this, but a lot of parents struggle with this. Parents or, or caring for an elderly parent um, feel a resentment about something that they deeply love, like a, toward a person that they deeply love. And it's so conflicting. Yeah. That's part of why it's a struggle to admit it. Like I really resent doing this, but it is a symptom that you're burning out. It actually is a symptom that something right. needs to shift and you need to really take very good care of yourself. Mm -hmm. The good news though, I, I will say is that it doesn't have to be a trans, like you, some things we can't get out of. We can't get out of these responsibilities. It doesn't have, it's, it's more of a psychological and an emotional shift. Like Jean was saying, if you're checking in with the body, taking stock of oneself, being really generous in your beliefs and thoughts towards yourself. Those things can give you more energy to do this because we're not going to, we're not off the hook. <laughs> we still have to do it. Right. Even if we're burning out. Right. And what are those things we can do? There's a lot more meditation offerings. I notice, you know, um, I, at least I get a lot of notices about these types of things. Um, and the thing about meditation, asked, though, Gail, if I can interrupt you for a second, is for some people, that's actually going to make it worse. How so? Well, if I'm struggling to stay present with myself, and then I tell myself I have to sit and do a 20-minute guided meditation, it could kick up so much stuff for people mm -hmm. that will be... They're, they're not going to be capable of holding on to it themselves because they are finally starting to get quiet. If somebody's an experienced meditator, then by all means. But, you know, if somebody's just starting to do that now, I would start with really, really small amounts of meditation. I mean, literally A five minute, minutes or something, three or minutes, something. right? Or even yoga practices, the same kind of thing, because a lot of times when people start to go into burnout or when they're trying to hold on to feelings, they breathe really shallowly, right? Because if I take a deep breath, the tears are gonna come. Uh, so when they start doing things like breath work or they start doing things like yoga practices, it can actually stir up a lot that they're not ready for. So um, to do that in conjunction with work with a therapist or a counselor or a pastor or a good friend who can hold that, whoever it is in your world who's safe for you, Mm -hmm. um, it, it's just a, a little word of warning because I've had simple, some people say to me, oh, I'll just sit and meditate every day for an hour. And I'm like, yeah, not a good idea to do that to start. Yeah, I'm glad you spoke. Yeah. What are some of the things that you um, do suggest? So um, Jude already mentioned a couple of them. I mean, I'm a big fan of, we had a meteor shower last night. Believe me, I was out on my patio looking for shooting stars. Um, but one of the tools from positive psychology that I love is the idea of, um, making a list and it could be two things. It doesn't have to be 20, but at the end of the day to list a couple of things that you did well that day, or a couple of things that you felt good about that day, because it's so easy that mother voice in my head will say, oh, well, I should have done this and I would have done and I could have, and why didn't I, and oh, I'm such an idiot. Right. And so to put that voice aside and sometimes the thing I did well today was not yell at my husband, right? Mm -hmm. That may be it. Or the thing I did well was I got out of bed and I put some clothes on. For mm -hmm. some days, it's that simple. Um, and I'm a big fan of doing a gratitude list. And again, the gratitude list can be really simple. It can be, um, I'm grateful for the yummy cup of coffee I had first thing this morning, or I'm grateful for the the smell of plumeria in my garden or whatever it is. And, uh, you know, I would, I would totally chime in on what Jude has said that I think nature in particular for a lot of people is a really helpful resource. I know for me, when I look at a night sky or, you know, I'm blessed to live close enough to the Pacific ocean because I'm here in California. Um, I can go to the beach. And when I look at that expansiveness, it helps me to become right-sized again, and it helps put my, my issues in perspective. Um, and when I look at the ocean or the night sky and I can come back to the present moment, I can take a deep breath. And um, that helps me to not be future tripping on what's 
not going to happen or what is going to happen and then step out of the regret of what I might have done, should have done, could have done, et cetera. So I don't know, Jude, if you want to add anything to that. Well, I love all those things. The writing of uh, the things, adding to the list of gratitude, it could be the re repetitive list or just finding a new thing. Um, there's, a, there's an exercise of just finding a moment of surprise that mm -hmm. happened throughout the day, something that actually was a discovery. If you don't have anything, it's okay. But to engage that part of your brain that says something new happened. It isn't the same old everything. Because if you're searching to find something to discover, you might find it. Right. Um, doing something creative. Absolutely. Is, yeah. So that's why writing, music, uh, <laughs> listening to storytelling could be Dancing. a good thing. Yeah. Yeah. Dean comes to my improv group on Sundays. I do. That's our whole mission, you know, art heals. And that's what you do, both of you. Um, well, we're both creative arts therapists. Yeah. Okay. So music or writing oh, or um, singing or, or improv. I mean, improv, anything that's going to get me into that right side of the brain and get me out of that, that busy negative voice in my head. I mean, you, you said it, Jude, I know when I was in training for positive psychology, we were broken into cohorts of six. And on a daily basis, we would, we were in a group text and each one of us would text the group our, our best moment of the day. And sometimes it was a quick video. Sometimes it was a picture. Sometimes it was a story about a moment that had happened. But the thing about that is that it was a positivity boost for each of us. Yeah. When I hear about, oh, you had a beautiful moment with your daughter today, or, oh, you, you know, you, you stood on a cliff at the beach and you listened to the sound of the waves or you watched the surfers or, or you planted in your garden, whatever it is, um, it lifted everybody's spirits as a result of it. And so, um, and as you said, Jude, teaching the brain to find those moments will shift the perspective, right. right? So even in that midst of burnout as a therapist, to be able to look for those moments in the course of my day working with my clients mm -hmm. where I can see something in them that's opening up. I mean, that's why we do what we do, right, Jude? It's just those yes. moments. And it, it's so inspiring and it does give me awe. Exactly. And some, even the slightest thing and I'll go, oh my God, that's a, like, that's amazing. And that's really happening. And if you train your brain to look for those things and then you see those things, um, that that's an expansion. Mm -hmm. And that's the opposite of what burnout is, which is um, a contraction. Right. Mm -hmm. I mean, even, even yoga poses where you're literally expanding are also really good things to do right. in that respect. I mean, I think of there's, for anybody who's interested in this stuff, there's wonderful work uh, by a woman named Amy Cuddy, who uh, it, I don't know if she's still at Harvard, but she was at the time. And she did a whole series of studies on power poses, like a Wonder Woman pose and V-shaped poses. And it, oh, yes, I've heard about that. Just right? doing the Wonder Woman pose is supposed to be very powerful. Yeah. It's very powerful. Part yeah. of her study was are... having people do that before they went into a mock job interview. Oh, that's wonderful. These yeah. are all, this is all fabulous. And I think, you know, um, er, earlier Stephanie uh, Wiseman had asked the question, you know, are the, are you finding virtual communities like Marsh Dream or helping? And if, if so, how, but hopefully I think this one is a good example because this is really important for people to hear and be reminded of because we all have those things in our lives. It, it's just, it's taking the moment to think about what it is you want, you're grateful for. And, and, um, those good things that have happened to the day or the accomplishments that we all can make in a day. Absolutely. Yeah. I also think it can be helpful if you need to cry, find something to help you do it. Like I've got some tried and true songs that I can put on or shows that I can watch or movies that will help me tap into that when I need to. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Um, there was an article, I think in the New York times this past week, it was a, an article about, um, kind of an ar the argument's not the right word, but it was making a case for the, the value of crying when you need oh, to. Because excellent. that grief will sit in the heart and it will obstruct the joy from getting in right. if it gets oh. too heavy. Yeah, um, sure. So we all need to cry sometimes. Indeed, we do. Yeah. And I am sorry that we are just about out of time already. Um, <laughs> um, Jude, any closing remarks that you'd like to make? 
Well, I'm just so grateful for this experience. I'm so grateful to be part of your, your stream. I've admired this show and I feel very lucky to have done this tonight and to have my dear friend Jean be part of it. I admire her so much and, and to have met you, Gail, and your team. I'm just so grateful. This was oh. a wonderful experience. It's our pleasure, and Jean, it's been just wonderful to have you here, and uh, Jude, it's it's um, a great pleasure to have you with us as well. So it's it's our honor, and um, I want uh, the audience to look in the chat room for links about our guests, so you can learn more about them and go to their websites and and learn more. And and I offer a very special thank you to Jude Trader Wolf and Jean Campbell and. Please, everyone, look for upcoming Solo Arts Heal show on the Marsh stream, and you'll see much more at themarsh.org. I want to um, announce next week, um, August 5th, we have a voice from the past with a contemporary message, Dr. Candace Campbell in an evening with Florence Nightingale, a 19th century humanitarian author, statistician, researcher, nurse, and visionary, really the person that started nursing. Florence Nightingale presents presented new ways to think about healthcare and her visionary wisdom stands the test of time. How can you make a difference in this crazy mixed up world? Miss Nightingale tackles the stuff, subjects that we wrestle with every day, diversity and acceptance versus prejudice of color, class or country, overcoming fear and social conditioning, conditioning acceptance and support of self and others. All of these things performed by Dr. Candy Campbell, who is an actor, director, speech co coach, and nurse. And so we're going to have a wonderful time next week with her. Um, again, thank you to our Zoom and YouTube audience and to Brian and Brianna and always to um, Stephanie, who's the Marsh Artistic Director, Stephanie Weissman. Stay healthy and safe, everyone, and see you next week. Thank you so much, Gail. And thank you, Jude and Jean. This was wonderful to hear this stuff. So needed during this time. And I just wanted to let you know and everyone know that we've just announced that we're doing an international solo festival. So Jude, maybe you might want to submit something to it. And I don't know, Jean, if you have some and Gail, you maybe. I'm going to do it. And this will be in October 7th through 11th. The submission deadline is August 16th. Another thing I wanted to mention that on Tuesday night, we have restorative yoga and sound healing as our Marsh stream. And that might be helpful to everyone who's going through that stress. It's really quite lovely. So thank you all again so much. Support us with a tip. Be healthy, stay strong, and have a wonderful day, week, and I'm going to be grateful for this show tonight. Thank you so much.